that's for um, for for people who who want to do both clinical research and um, and also wants to be in contact with some with patients as well. So it, it was kind of mixed. And um, there, the the um, the PI there um, used to call us a mutation because it, it was not something common that, uh, for it to happen in in our country, the Dominican Republic, that someone wanted to do research. And I happened that mutation. Um, I'm happy to say that that mutation happened to me because it changed my life. And then um, I did PPCR, um, and it was my real um, entrance door into the research world. So now we have a bit of a of a I might say um, ambitious agenda for tonight, and I've divided it, it into different topics. Um, first of all, we're going to do a bit of housekeeping, and I'm just going to tell you how this is going to work. I'm going to provide you with a bit of information on each of the topics that are listed here, PPCR, IRI, MPH, and my current um, residency application. And um, at the end, um, we, I'm going to answer some of the questions that you may come up with, during during your um, during the talk, so if you have any burning questions, just write them in the chat, and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. So, first, let's talk a bit about principles and practice of clinical research. Um, this amazing course, I did the main course, and I also participated in the three-day advanced statistical workshop and the research proposal propo proposal writing workshop. I have to say, and um, PPCR provides you with a great foundations in clinical research methodology overall. And the depth of the content is, such, um, is to such a degree that I even refer back to the notes that I took, for instance, for the three-day um, three advanced statistical workshop, now that I'm taking regression courses in the MPH. So I, I, can say, I can say with certainty that you will have the tools necessary to launch your career as a clinical researcher once you have completed PPCR. So I, I, what else can I say? I, I, and it's written here, it really altered the course of my professional life and shaped my future. Because PPCR is not, does not only create, gives you the tools for you to jumpstart your career as a researcher, but also allows you to create great networking. And if it wasn't for PPCR, I wouldn't have done anything that came past PPCR. I met the person who introduced me to IRI during PPCR. Everything happened to me after PPCR um, in terms of research. So I've been a uh, teaching assistant for the past two years in the program. And it, I have to say again, it's been a great experience. So next um, in the ladder is the International Research Initiative. And how did I come to be, uh, come here? So during my, the Boston workshop, I met Alma and, um, and they introduced us to what were the opportunities for students who wanted to continue their training in clinical research and get hands-on experience. So that's where I met um, um, what the International Research Initiative meant and I decided to apply. So what is the International Research Initiative or IRI? It's basically a program where you receive rigorous and comprehensive training in research particularly and we have different um, branches which you can choose from and they, those include clinical research, translational, or basic science. We also, as part of the program, provide students or participants with research methodology training. This comes in the, in the form or in the flavor of PPCR. So those current fellows who have not completed PPCR will be, will be able to experience PPCR throughout the program while they are doing, having hands-on experience with, um, with research. We also provide career development seminars weekly meetings where you have peer-to-peer -peer discussions, you, pro you present your progress and your projects to your peers, and they will give you feedback and what they think. Um, and you basically will have such an amazing experience with everyone giving them, giving you the different inputs that they have on the diverse body of topics that will come up because not only are not these people, those who partake of the program will not only be um, in surgery, for instance, which is uh, my area of interest, but they will, all, they, will be, they will be from cardiology, from gastroenterology, from many different other diverse body of, of knowledge that will bring fresh ideas to your projects and different perspectives. And what we ask is, or what the program is, is basically a one-year commitment to the program and to, and to your principal investigator. If you want more information about this, um, you can visit the website or you can email us at this um, email address. 
What is interesting about the program is that we have what we call perfect matching. And this is um, basically you tell us your preferences and we'll try to do the best in our hands to match it to the perfect or to your perfect match. So if let's say um, you want to do podiatry and we don't have podiatry, so you let us know and we'll do the best so that we can match it. So what is needed to apply? Here I've included the list of things that we look for in, um, that applicants need to provide. We need um, your curriculum, personal statements, one letter of recommendation, um, your medical school transcript, and also there is an application fee. However, I must say that this year, applications will be closed due to COVID-19. So probably next year, um, they will open. But as of, two, as of this year, they will be closed. So if you have any questions, um, want to keep you updated on this. So this is my class. And honestly, um, you would not believe the kind of bonds that you create with the people that you work with during um, your, your stay at the program. And this is my class. These were my friends, um, roommates, some of them. And these people were amazing. That's, I mean, you, you start a program being totally total strangers, strangers, and then you become, they become your family. So it's a great opportunity for you to not only network, but meet some of the, and create some of the deepest bonds that you will create throughout your professional career. So um, now, in particular, I was matched to my lab of choice, um, and I want to be a surgeon. My interest lie in um, hepatopancreatic or biliary surgery, as well as um, transplant surgery. And so my lab was, um, my lab head or principal investigator was Dr. Tara Kent, and um, all of these at the bottom, we were her research fellow. So what can I tell you about this? First, you need to identify your PI, and this will be the person that you will be matched to and in the program. And then you have to identify whether that PI will be your mentor or not. And in here, I want to make this point. And, in, and I think this is the most important part about um, the research lab. And it is that you don't need one mentor. Your mentor doesn't necessarily mean, need to be your PI. I was lucky enough that my PI is my current mentor as well one of many mentors that I have actually, but you, you have peer mentors. Your friends, your um, classmates are your mentors as well. They, are, they have lived different experiences. These people that you see here, um, this is Manuel Castillo and this is um, Rodrigo Calvillo. They have been great mentors to me they, because they have lived stuff that I have not lived yet and they, have, they are able to guide me when I need their help. Your PI mentor, and you, you have add-on mentors. And I don't mean to say that they are on top, like add-on as the word says, but they are your mentors as well. And I might have to say, for instance, Professor Fregni, in my case, he, he's one of my mentors. I've asked for his opinion and, and I'm going to talk about it um, down the lane. But for instance, when I was debating whether to go into the MPH or not, I went to him and I asked, what do you think? And, and so, you don't need to, to, to think that your PI will necessarily be your mentor, but keep an open mind and look for any opportunity in which you can learn. And the other thing about the resource experience, and I have to say, is guided independence. And this is a, kind of a, a difficult topic because it could be um, a make it or break it deal. And it's one of the most dif difficult things that you will have to go through. And, most um, of the PIs are, are very um, busy. They do clinical work. Um, some of them do not do clinical work and they dedicate um, their lives to doing um, research, but many of the PIs have um, clinical work. So you need to know um, when you need to reach out to your PI, because if your expectation is that your PI will um, hold your hand throughout the process, that's not going to happen. You need to be independent. You need to um, know what kind of questions to, to ask your PI. And then here is the, the most important part. So you rely on your peers. You rely on different steps before you go to the last, to the last one. So um, if one of the challenges that I would say is, is one of the most difficult things to learn is to be independent and, and to, to know how to use that guided independence. So 
As a research fellow, I was focused on two main branches. Those were, um, I, I worked in educational projects and in clinical projects. And um, in, in the educational, I was exposed to a variety of topics in, in surgical education um, related to both education for residents and education for patients. And it was amazing. And, and, and again, and this is very important. Is surgical education something that goes or aligns with your career path? If it is, so great. I want to be a surgical education. I want to become an academic surgeon. So this is the kind of exposure that will make a difference in my future. And then in the clinical, on the clinical side of things, I, I studied the liver pancreas and the biliary um, system. So um, transitioning um, to the Master of Public Health, I, I went to Boston with the idea that I wanted to do two years um, worth of research. And, and I said, okay, so I've done my first year, um, but, but what else? Um, I want something else. Uh, I, I see that my research interests are focused on outcomes related to racial disparities, ethnic disparities, and which are public health related topics. And I said, okay, so I, I want the foundations of public health. Um, and as well, I needed to, I mean, when I wanted to take my, my methodological goals to the next step. So that's when I decided to um, go for the Masters of Public Health. It was convenient. Um, I was in Boston. Um, one of the best school of public health is located in Boston, which is the Harvard K. Chan School of Public Health. So I embarked on this. And, and, and as I have said, I needed more methodological skills. I, I, I wanted to, um, in, to learn about public health um, foundations. Also, my career outlook and as well, physician scientist uh, is one I want to become, one I want to be and my practice to be not only seeing patients, but producing knowledge. And, and where? So where can you do it? I only apply for the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, but there are many others. There, there are many other pro programs which you can apply to. And I've listed here um, the Association of um, Public Health Schools um, website that you can go in and you will find amazing information there. And also there are other options that you can pursue. You can pursue a Master's of Science, PhD, et cetera. Um, but for instance, a Master's of Science will not provide you with probably with the foundation for, for public health and it's not a, and it's more of an academic degree than um, um, a practical degree as the MPH is. So then we have the MPH and we have, it comes in different flavors. The one that I chose was clinical effectiveness. And, but you have an array of things from which you can choose from. If you're interested only in method, methods, in biostatistical methods, you can go for quantitative methods. But why did I choose clinical effectiveness? So clinical, clinical effectiveness provide, provided me with the flexibility that I wanted to be able to partake biostatistical classes and epidemiological classes as well. Some classes, some classes um, that would allow me to develop um, other skills that were not as hard as those biostatistic and epidemiolog epidemiological basis, but um, that would be of, of my interest as a future um, physician scientist. And um, for those who have a medical degree, um, you are able to do this program in, in one academic year but also you might be able to become a part-time student and do it over two years, or you can do it only as a summer only student. There are many options. So how does the application go? Um, the application, you have to apply through SOFAs. And um, up until now, and I tell you, if you're interested in applying, please go and visit the websites and um, keep track of the, prog of the programs because um, I think yesterday um, they updated the website. And, the requirements for you to apply include test scores. And these test scores are DRE and TOEFL. DRE uses as a metric of your knowledge in, um, sorry, uh, math and um, writing or your, your writing proficiency. And, um, and TOEFL to see your English proficiency. And as of yesterday, the standardized exams for entrance are optional. They're not needed for your admittance into the programs. So this is an opportunity if you were planning or you just decided to apply, you just have to take um, the TOEFL um, to be able, because um, make sure to know that TOEFL has not been um, waived. Only the DRE or, M or 
GMAT or whichever test you, you wish to use. What else do you need? You need the personal statement. You need to sell yourself. You need to tell them why you're a good fit for the program and um, what will you bring to the program and why the, good, the, the program is a good fit for you. And, um, and I think this is very important. You need to, and now more than ever, it is also important because when I've talked to them, they've mentioned that they are able to assess your, your written proficiency through your personal statement as well. So be able to transmit what is it you want to convey. And, um, and this is a very important part of your application personal statement. We talked about test scores and letters of recommendation. And the only thing that I have to say here is um, stay away from genetic letters of recommendation. They will do you no good. In the CV and resume part of things, I would say that you need to be consistent and you need to, to be consistent what you have in your CV and what you write in your personal statement. Something I forgot to mention is you're applying um, for a master's of public health if that's what you decide to do. So be consistent and mention why public health. If you've had any experience, but um, you, you need to be, you need to target your um, your your personal statement to the program that you're applying to. If you are applying for masters of public health, let's say in global health, you need to target those experiences that um, made you realize why you wanted to to go for masters of public health in global health, and why you feel like right now you are in a place that demands that you go one step further and pursue a graduate degree. So if you are considering, if, you, if this is just today that you've realized that you want to apply, you can still apply for this cycle. So it is um, a good moment to start. And um, what can I say about the master's? I'm in my second semester of the master's. Um, I've completed what we call the program in clinical effectiveness and only those who partake in the master's of public health in um, clinical effectiveness or are doing the masses of, um, of science with a focus on epidemiology will need to take the program in clinical effectiveness. Um, it's a summer program. It, it, it applies for degree and non-degree applicants. It is, um, it's going to constitute 15 credits. They are done in six weeks. This is really intensive and I have to tell you, it's really intense, but it's worth it. You will take um, your biostatistics score right there. And I, and I have to mention this, and I, I put it in a box on here. Keep an open mind. Take advantage of all the opportunities that present to you. And if you went into the master's program saying, yes, I came here because I, I knew what I wanted to do. I just need to get the tools. No, it's okay that you have that, but keep an open mind. I've now developed a really interest into what is known as decision sciences. I took a course in the summer that was it was the heaviest course I've taken in a while, and still I've developed a very keen interest for this um, for this um, branch of research, and network, network, network. I know that we are facing a pandemic right now, and that we are not able to physically connect. But still, I was able to do great networking during the summer and create great connections with people, even though we were um, connect um, having lectures through Zoom and everything. So moving on to the next topic, residency application during COVID-19. And um, so don't, and I have to make again this disclosure, don't, don't take everything that I say here at face value. Um, so we are during this process right now, um, you know, applications are delayed and most of the information that I've provided here is based on what I've read and, um, and how I've been preparing for this application. So, I won't go through the normal process because most of, I'm sure most people know what the normal process is, but, and I will, I will touch on, on, mo on all of the different components of the application. But I just want to, to mention, highlight now what has changed um, due to COVID and, um, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll cover all the bases. So as an international medical graduate, we need to be um, ECFMG certified. ECFNG is a body that regulates those that graduate outside of the US. And, um, and for that certification, we have requirements. These are, these are the, to have successfully completed USMLE step one, 2CK and 2CS. During the pandemic, there has been a massive or, well, not massive, they, they canceled step 2CS for at least 12 to 18 months. 
And now we will have virtual interviews. We'll touch about on this topic in a while because this might seem as a, as a positive thing, but it can play, it, it is a two-way street. So for IMGs, not having a step two means that um, it is not required for US medical graduates um, for their application, nor is it required for, for um, international medical graduates. However, it is required for international medical graduates to participate in the match process, meaning to be able to um, be ranked by, their, by the different programs in which they interview. So step two is still required for, um, for ECFMG certification. However, it is waived based on certain conditions um, should, the IM, should the applicant fulfill them. So they, there have been some burning questions that I don't have answered to, but they linger around and these are, Will programs prefer IMGs who have already clear step to CS regardless of certification status? And will programs interview applicants who are yet to be ECFMG certified? To answer the first question, this is very um, specialty dependent. And um, from what I've been able to gather, it will not have an impact, but it is very specialty and program dependent. And the second one, um, this has never been a requirement um, to interview applicants to for for applicants to be interviewed so that they need to be ECFNG certified. So some programs will not interview you, will not um, extend you an interview, but some will. So, um, so I, I wouldn't worry too much about the second part. So I wasn't able to take step to CS, now what? What, what happens? So ECFMG has created what they call pathways and they have different ways in which you can get certified um, based on those pathways. And also you need to um, clear that an English proficiency, proficiency assessment that is called the Occupational English Test. And I've included here to the right, um, something that I got off Twitter. And I know this is not rigorously, rigorously done, um, but it does provide interesting information. And basically they did this for diagnostic radiology applicants and, um, and whether, U.S. medical students will apply to more than usual, more programs that they usually do in a normal application cycle. And as we can see here, the vast majority, um, yes, the overwhelming vast majority, I would say more than 80% of them will apply to more than the more programs that they usually do. And this represents a problem. It, and um, and I will will talk a bit about it and, and, and why this is a problem, because this is a two-way road. And many applicants used to limit their application list based on travel costs, both US IMGs, US medical students and IMGs. But now there will be an overwhelming number of applicants to programs. And if, now, if they use the current filters, which are step one, and they only leave the um, 25th percentile of applicants that have the best step one scores, then many and advantaged applicants will be left out of this. So the burning question here is, if programs will, will still have the same number of uh, available slots for, app, um, for interviews or will they increase the number of interview offers? And some of them have been very keen and vocal about this and they have provided some reassuring information saying, saying that they will um, increase the number of applicants, um, of, sorry, of interview slots available um, for, for the different applicants. And um, also important to, to mention here, is that um, this, this um, application cycle also represents other, other challenges in terms of what they are expecting from you in the virtual interview. So other things that have been done is the NRMPs um, has, done a, has provided, let's say, a solution, possible solution for this. And it has come in, in the way of an extra round of SOAP and for those who are not familiar with what the SOAP is, it's a supplemental offer and acceptance of program. So if you apply to the match and you did not match, then um, you're able to look for programs that have unmatched, posi unmatched positions and, be, and try to match. So they have included a, an extra round and, um, just in case um, this that I've just mentioned happens. So now um, let's talk a bit about the occupational English test. In lieu of USMLE Step 2 CS Spoken English Proficiency section, um, they have um, the ECFNG has come with, come up with the Occupational English Exam, and it's it's um, comprised of four sections: listening, 
reading, writing, and speaking. And um, here I've listed um, the, the amount of time that it probably takes per session. And I would say that you should probably allot for the test to be four hours, but it's actually, it varies because you can have your speaking test um, at 12 at noon, and then you, the rest of the test will be at 5 p.m. So it's, it's a kind of a whole day kind of exam. The only um, thing that I can recommend here is that you, the writing section has very specific requirements and is that you, time, um, you perform time practice um, for this exam. Mainly if you're taking it at a center, um, you will have to write this by hand and it's not the same when you write in computer and then you, you never practice in, in hand, by hand and this is what happened to me and, and then time is of the, of the essence here. There are other options for people who are not in the US to be able to take this exam, which um, you can take it at home and this is just something new or even at Prometric. And, and in my opinion, if you have been exposed to either the TOEFL exam or the GRE and you've been able to obtain at least an average score, you will need to dedicate a lot of time to prepare this exam. But this is just an opinion and um, be, uh, be aware that the writing section is, um, is yeah, it has very specific requirements. So try to spend some time there if you can. So um, this is um, general my general opinion about the personal statement and the things that I've read. Um, and take it from someone who has written around five or six different personal statements and does not feel um, still comfortable with what has been written. And I think this is the, the most difficult part of the application. And um, what I can say is um, beware of the language that you use to describe yourself and the kind of um, story that you want to portray. Um, and, this has, and, um, and this has been very um, research and it has to do with biases and the way that you portray yourself and the way that I perceive yourself when I read something that I write based on, on the kind of words that you and, and this be amplified by whether you yourself as someone who is correlated versus related. It's just one of the many examples that, um, that we can, that we can um, have, but there are many other examples in terms of language. I might also want to say that this is not the place for you to um, put your CV again, but this is the place for you to transmit something that you kind of put in your CV and to, so that those who read it get to know you a little bit better. And this is just a general recommendation. It's organization. And I know this is very difficult. Um, I, I can tell you from uh, first-hand experience is that you need to provide, for instance, an identifiable thesis in the introductory paragraph. And you also need to um, have a, such a structure that it allows the reader to know what, what they're reading and where you're taking them. So if you introduce in the, in the first paragraph that you're going to talk about um, situations in the Dominican Republic that made you a great doctor, and that's your first idea, so make sure that you develop that idea in your first paragraph. But don't talk about something in your introductory paragraph and then never mention it again. You need to mention it at some point um, during your writing. Regarding um, virtual interviews, the American Medical Association has released a set of tips um, for applicants. Um, you can access it here. Um, I provided a link here. Um, where they provide with students with a list of potential tips to use for the interviews. And virtual interviews will be different. And um, although not included here, you can have what is known as asynchronous um, interviews, wherein the programs might ask you to record an answer to several questions and simply send that to them. Or you can have synchronous interviews, which is a live interview with an interviewer in front of you asking you live questions. Um, as in other, um, in the past years, be prepared to answer behavioral questions, situational questions, as well as the simple question known as, tell me about yourself, which is that simple that many of us might not be prepared to um, to, to answer that question and tell anyone about ourselves in an organized manner. Um, and lastly, about letters of recommendation. Again, avoid letters of recommendation that cannot provide insight into your character, generic letters of recommendation. So making a list of programs, and here is, this is very important. You need to know 
what you what your application will tar target. Are you applying for a preliminary position? Are you applying for a categorical position? And um, what is a preliminary position? A preliminary position is usually a one-year position, wherein you are only secure one year of training. Categorical position is a position where you are secure the whole duration of your training at that particular program. Preliminary positions come in two flavors. We have designated versus non-designators. And what's the difference between them? A non-designated position is, let's say I'm applying for general surgery and I want to do um, only one year of general surgery, but I'm not doing anything else. So that's it. You're not designated towards anything else. But let's say that you want to do vascular surgery. So you apply for a preliminary position in general surgery, but you know that you have a, sec um, a secured, second, um, secured second year spot somewhere else. Somewhere else. And this applies um, much to radiology applicants, I would say, in relation to, to surgery, because they have to apply for um, general surgery um, or any transitional year or other positions. Then they go into radiology, for instance, in their second year and they match into a designated position to continue their training at another program or at the same institution, just in a different program. The other decision that you need to make is, are you looking to apply for a university-based versus a university-based or community-based versus a community-based um, institution? And university-based is basically an institution that is affiliated with a hospital. And we have many examples of these, um, let's say, Beth Israel, for those that are in Boston, Mass General, um, Brigham's and Women. But we also have um, university associated, um, and these are kind of a mix between community programs and university programs. And you also have community programs um, that are standalone community programs. And I need to um, warn you about this. If you think that you may want to go back to your country, you need to take consideration of this because some of your countries, and I speak for the Dominican Republic, have regulatory agencies that do not allow you to come back to the Dominican Republic and practice medicine as a specialist if you um, come from a, a community-based institution because the title is not supervised by university. So this is important and you need to check with your, um, with your home institutions to see if you would be accredited. Um, another thing, and, and this is based on your career outcomes. What are you looking for? I, do you want to be an acad academician? Do you want to just practice? So, and, and for instance, you may be able to have a lot more independence if you go to a community program than if you go to an university-based program, given that universities, university-based programs have a lot of fellowships there. And you might not be able to get the kind of exposure that you are looking for um, if if, if you go to a university-based program as opposed to a community program. So there are many burning questions um, to answer um, that particular one. And then your immigration status. Will the program give you a J-1 visa versus an H-1B? For those not familiar with it, J-1 visas are basically um, exchange visas, visas that tie you to go back to your home country uh, for at least two years and then you can come back into the U.S. or you can waive that requirement um, working at a place um, an underserved community in the United States. And H-1B visas are usually um, what we know as the work visa, and that they do not have that requirement, and you can um, basically go from an H-1B to a green card, et cetera. And you need to take that into consideration. So um, what tools did I use to make my, my program, my list of programs? I use the well-known Freda, and now we have this new tool called the Residency Explorer. And Residency Explorer takes into consideration whether um, your STEP scores are good or not. I mean, it takes into consideration all of your CV and everything you've been building up until now and, um, and, um, and gives you a percentage of the probability that you have of matching at a given institution. And this is just what I've included here in the picture down here. Uh, at the bottom of the screen. So these are great tools. I really recommend Residency Explorer. It's a good tool. So if you ask me, is research necessary? And that question is yes or no. Um, there's no clear answer. So it depends on your academic endeavors. Do you want to be an academic physician, academic surgeon? Do you want to become a physician scientist? 
Um, research is not only important because of the knowledge that you will get, but also because of the networking. Another question is, will a graduate degree make, make or break, break my application? And the answer is no. Um, as you can see here, I've um, obtained this information from NRMP's data. Um, this, this just was released a few, a few um, days ago. And as you can see, um, the blue one, the, the dark blue portrays those who, who matched and those who didn't. And it basically makes no difference whether you have an, an, a graduate deg degree. But um, if you ask me, would I do it again? Would I take this path? Would I um, apply for a graduate degree? Um, would I do my research fellowship? Everything? Absolutely. So you need to consider what your career pathways, um, pathway and where you want to be um, um, before making a decision or committing to anything. So, and, and I, I want to touch on this, um, and I was speaking with um, someone in, about this the other day, and I think this is very important. Twitter and social media, now that we are um, applying and, and residency programs will not be able to meet you in person. And these will become pivotal in your application. So as I mentioned, most programs won't be able to meet prospective applicants in person. Therefore, how you portray yourself in social media could, and this is just my own opinion, there's nothing proven here, my opinion here, um, play an important role in your application. And I want to bring this forward because even now when you submit a paper, um, they even ask for your Twitter handle. So Twitter has now become a source of invaluable information, not only for programs, but also for you as an applicant. So follow programs in their Twitter accounts. There are many recruitment activities in which you can partake. And also important to mention is that you treat your Twitter account as any other professional account that you have, such as LinkedIn or anything like that. So as you can see here, um, this is my professional account. So if you want to have a personal account, then great. That's, uh, that's absolutely great if you want to have that. But, um, but be a, be, be, make sure that you have your, your, your Twitter account yielded um, or towards um, professionalism when it comes to your application. One second, I've lost my cursor. So, for instance, this is something I got from, from, from Twitter. And this is basically an upcoming event that is happening right after this meeting. And it's, it's a very important event, I would say, for us as an applicant, as IMG applicants. So as a summary, and excuse me one second, I've lost my cursor here and I cannot see my screen. Okay, okay. So um, recommendations um, that I want to give you is have an idea of what you want um, your next step to be, where you see yourself in 10 years, when you see yourself in, in three years. Um, so this is very important so that you can start working on what you want um, and, and have adequate preparation for it. I'm not saying not live in the, in, the, in the present, not to live in the present, but also plan ahead. Choose your mentors carefully. Um, and, and always ask yourself, are they invested in your growth? But more importantly, choose your friends and peers more carefully because these people will have a greater influence in your day-by-day -day, um, life than, than what you might think is possible. And, and um, this is something that the, the one that is in red here that I want to highlight because this is very important. And this is not all about your academic excellence, your academic career. It does actually play a big role in, in, in what we do. But are you a good fit? Is a program a good fit for you? And not only to programs, in general, um, do you have a good personality? Um, are you empathetic? These are things that are very important that you need to have into, take into consideration. Another important thing and I, that, I, that I've learned during the past few years is that there is no such a thing as a free lunch. And that you need to, when you hear, hear something, read something you can trust, but verify from trustworthy sources. And most importantly, enjoy the ride. Because um, life is happening and you need to enjoy whatever you're doing. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions.
Great, thank you, John, for this great, wonderful presentation. You went over all your path and your career, and of course, that all of us in PPC are really proud of all your, your achievements. And now we have great questions from beginning with Stephanie, actually from Santo Domingo. She's, she's saying, thank you, John, for sharing your experience with us. It is really inspiring. I would like to know what were the most challenging uh, parts of the MPH application for you and how do you address them? Thank you. Okay, so the most challenging part, again, as in the application for, um, for residency was the personal statement. You need to know what you want to convey. This is very important. And um, also, I think challenging was identifying correct pe the correct people to ask for letters of recommendation. Someone that would not give a generic recommendation, but some, some the people that would provide um, accurate um, feedback or represent um, what my, my, my career endeavors were. So I, I would say those two parts were, the, were key. Um, personal statement and letters of recommendation. Those were the most challenging part. Um, and um, as well as the GRE, of course. Um, I would say for the GRE, um, you need to study, if, you, if you've been away uh, for quite some time re, um, in topics like basic math, et cetera, it would take some time for you to get back on your feet. Great, thank you. And then Javier, also from Dominican Republic is asking, I would like to know, which of the two research paths do you selected for either the educational branch or the clinical one? Um, which one was more attractive for you and what general recommendation do you have to another person who is interested in those same topics? Okay, so I didn't choose a particular one because um, unfortunately for me, there was no other fellow at my lab and I was able to juggle both of them. So I was doing both kind of research. I'm currently doing both kind of research. And, um, and I would say, so in, if you're unsure of what you want to do and you want, you, you're getting into general surgery, but you don't, you don't know whether you want to do thoracic surgery or gastrointestinal surgery or um, oncologic surgery or transplant surgery, I would say you go for um, surgical education. And then, and then you, you have a, a a broader field in which you can branch out later on, as opposed to marrying to HPV and transplant, um, as I did, uh, which will not necessarily impact your prospective fellowship applications, but at least you'll be doing something that you like. So if you're sure for certain that you want to do a particular clinical um, fellowship afterwards, I would say, of course, go with the clinical side of research. If you're unsure, go with the educational side of things. Um, and, um, and even though I, I want to do gastrointestinal surgery, for instance, I would not um, have given um, surgical education or taken it as a, as a secondary topic as I'm both fascinated by, by both of these branches. Great, thank you, John. And then Augusto from Boston side, um, he's asking you, do you take the PCE and is currently attending the MPH semester only online due to the, due the pandemic? Do you know if the universities already decided how the programs will be offered next year, online or in campus? There's no, there's, there, no decision has been made. We don't currently know whether, even if we're going to have a spring semester that is in person or not. So no decision has been currently made. I know for a fact that, um, and this has been talked about throughout our program at the, at the MPH, and is that COVID um, showed that we could do online education and be as effective as um, physical education. So I don't know how it will impact um, in the upcoming years on how programs are delivered overall, but I do expect that um, at some point we'll go back to campus. I cannot tell you um, in, the, in, the, in the foreseeable future what will happen, um, but as of now, we are taking online classes. Yes, correct, and uh, they also announced that um... Um, it won't be open until June, so we're still getting new uh, feedback and recommendations uh, according to what is happening and, uh, and waiting for the next wave of, of the COVID and, and how the city will, will have. So then um, we have Pablo Cortez question. He's from Manaus, Brazil, and he's asking you, thank you, John, for the amazing talk. 
Can you talk about the job opportunities that the MPH can bring to the researcher? What comes after it? So great question. And I think, um, I think, and um, there was one talk of one person that came before me and he's from my lab. Um, his name is Manuel Castillo. He's, um, let's say, uh, the poster, um, the, he's a poster um, exemplification of what could come after the MPH. So there is this prestigious place um, at the Brigham, which is a Harvard institution called the CSPH, which is, a, which is a center for surgery and public health. And you can become a research fellow there. You can become a research fellow um, there are many opportunities um, when you are in the, Harvard Net, in the Harvard network, you receive job opportunities, job offers, even as a student. Um, even right now, as a, second, as a second semester student, I've received job offers um, from different institutions. You can go to the, um, to the pharma, you can go uh, and become biostatistician if that's what you choose. So it depends on what you want to do. But um, if you look at the statistics of the Harvard School of Public Health, I think employment rates after the, pro the program are 97%. And if, if you're not employed, you want to know why it is. It's because you're pursuing a sec another degree. Not because you didn't find a job. It's because you're, you're doing further education. So I, I think that doors open for you. Um, and, and it depends on what you want to do. Yes, completely agree. There are many options there. And then also Sunil is asking in Facebook. She's asking if the PCE can be taken uh, in another way and not just in the summer as an intensive program? The PCE per se, no, it needs to be taken in the summer as an intensive program. You don't need to be a part of a degree program to take it, but, um, but it needs to be taken in the, the summer because the, the, the problem or not the problem, the thing is that some of the classes that we take, those particular classes, let's say, by by stats classes only in in the in the format and the way that they have formatted it for us to get all the concepts are only given during the summer so they're not given during other semesters so it is they only open during the summer so to take the core the bio statistics core it needs to be taken um during the summer and to be able to um receive your certificate you need to have certain minimum requirements and over the past few years, it has been that you take at least 15 credits, minimum of 15 credits. They relaxed that requirement this year due to COVID to 10 credits. And I, am, I assume that it will go back to being 15 credits. So it needs to be, um, you, need to take a, you need to take the whole thing together to be able to get the certificate. Yes, that is correct. And then we got Mateo Garland from Boston. He asks, he asks, he's saying, hi, John. Thanks for the inspiring talk. Is it possible to be a research fellow at Boston and, and the MPH at the same time, or if there is a time constraint difficult to maintain both? Thank you. So, okay, a great question. And yes, the answer is yes. Um, again, I'm going to refer to this person, Manuel Castillo. He did it at the same time. I was going to do it at the same time as well. I couldn't, although I work as a fellow um, remotely. I couldn't, I'm back in the Dominican Republic um, due to COVID. But yes, it is totally possible um, to do to do both both of them at the same time. I might mention: um, Will you be able to be as effective during the PCE as you were prior to the PCE in juggling both both things? No, I don't think it's possible. But you might be if you organize yourself well, you will be able to do at least one third of your work um, and during the PCE, and then you can go back to being your usual self. Um, during the, the other semesters, which are not um, as, time, as time intensive. Yes, and actually you and Manuel were doing the, the MPH and being research fellows and also TAs in the program. So it does, that's even more and you can do it, yes. And then um, <laughs> Paolo is asking um, that if, if, if the GRE grades are being optional. Yes, Paolo, they updated that on August. Actually, uh, so for applying right now for the MPH, you can go also to the website and confirm it's optional for you to take it. Uh, they're also being doing, being, being, uh, some people are taking it online. That depends on to you. But if you go to the, I can send the application link to you, Paolo. But yes. And then um, someone else want to ask something? Let me check again in Facebook. And it's, you are free to open your mic and talk directly to John. Please, uh, profit this this time that, uh, that we got him here today. Um, 
Then Stefania is asking, John, what is your experience and or your opinion about job opportunities in the Dominican Republic for MDs that dedicated their career to public health? That's a really good question. So, um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think we are having um, a reform in our, in the way that we are approaching public health in the Dominican Republic right now. There, I know for a fact that they opened the residency in, in epidemiology and public health. And so I think the outlook will be good. As of now, I'm not sure about the positions that are available um, to, to, for people that want to work in, in, in particularly in public health. But I know that with COVID, um, there, are, there were many initiatives and, um, and um, I think that we are changing and we're changing um, towards positive things. And I think more opportunities will come um, and, um, and I think we, we are also making a difference in, in, in the way that we approach um, research and, and, and yeah, so I think we, we will see many changes in the upcoming years and yeah. Yes, I, I agree with John. Um, every year things are changing and we hope the clinical research and public health improving in Latin America and is much needed. Then we also have a question in Facebook from Edmundo, who is, who is a senior chair right now in the program, and he's asking if having a specialty already uh, done before applying to the same residency help you out. What do you think about that? So I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. I know, I, I know many surgeons, and I would say yes, I know a very successful surgeon who was a surgeon in his, in his country and then came to the U.S., did two year of research and match uh, the program of his choice. And he just graduated and went to do a, 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 a I think a, a an acute care surgery fellowship at, at Mayo Clinic. So he, he was very successful. I cannot speak to whether it helps or not, but I can say that it's definitely doable. So I would say that um, if you have your specialty and you want to apply, um, I think your application will, will, will have its forte and it's um, as all applications. So I would not, I would not um, um, shy away from applying if that's your case. Raimundo, I also believe that if you don't have gaps and you keep training and you were working in surgery in this case, for example, it, it will help you out. Experience is really valid. And uh, if you show in your personal statement that, that will help you a lot. Um, I also know people who have done the residency before and come, and yes, it, it, it might help you. Um, then we have another question from Paolo. He's asking, John, do, John, do you have, do you know scholarships opportunities or organizations for funding students at the MPH? So, in particular for the MPH in clinical effectiveness, we don't have that much support. Um, and, um, but I think that if you apply, for instance, through Fulbright, um, you might be able to, to get funding and you can apply for scholarships based on your career interests. For instance, when I applied and got accepted, they asked for information about what my research might be focused on so they, they can get you some sort of partial funding. Let's say um, I know people who applied and, and their research was in cardiology, for instance. So there are funded projects in cardiology in which you can work as a research assistant and you get partially funded for the, for the MPH. And, um, and yes, so I would not shy away again if you don't think that you can, you, don't, you have the fundings, there's always the option of um, student loans um, and, and you can take them as well. But, um, Depending on, on what your concentration in your research is, um, I would say that, yes, you can, there are funding opportunities there. Yes, thank you. A student knows she's putting, say, say, saying that, yeah, sometimes there are, there are the, the interests are high. Um, that depends. <laughs> and then um, just that, we don't have any other question. Please feel free to add any other one. I'm checking on Facebook. Um, not anymore here. Um, so, okay, great. So thank you, John, for your time and for being here today, for all your work in the program. We wish you a lot of success in your career. And, uh, and do you have any final comments to the students and, and people who are joining us right now? 
So um, thank you for coming um, to, tonight. Um, I really appreciate your assistance, your attendance here. If you have any questions, I did not include my email, but I will include it in the chat um, now when I find my mouse, because I, I cannot see my mouse. <laughs> so I would say keep pursuing whatever you want to do, is it, be it residency, be it MPH, do not shy away and, um, and have a plan. And if it's not this year, then next year it will be. And um, don't shy away. Just give a good fight and, and pursue your dreams. Great, thank you, John. And everybody's saying thank you, great talk. So everyone have a nice night and thank you once more for being here. We will see you in our, our next PPCR talk. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.